Well, good morning and uh, welcome to Awake. God has some great things for us in his word this morning, and we're going to be taking a look at a, an amazing story that Jesus told 2,000 years ago that resonates so powerfully today. Before we do that, however, could we just join together in a word of prayer? Let's come before the Lord asking that his Holy Spirit would, would minister to us in a very powerful way this morning, drawing us into his presence, enabling us to understand his truth and to apply that truth to our lives. So let, let's begin that way, shall we? Heavenly Father, we, we are in absolute awe of you. You are such a good and gracious God. We thank you that we can rely upon you in every time of our lives, in every circumstance, whether it be time of joy or time of difficulty and trial. We thank you that you are faithful. We praise you for your word that speaks directly into each one of our hearts, a word that transforms us from within, a word that gives assurance and comfort and hope in Jesus, our risen Savior and our returning King. May we hear his voice this morning and hear him clearly as he speaks to us, as he calls us into your presence, as he invites us, invites us to experience life in all its fullness, fully awake for the day of his coming, his final appearing. This we pray in his strong name. Amen. amen. And amen. Well, it's good to see you all this morning and good to be back. We're going to be taking a look at one of the greatest stories ever told this morning. But first, I have a story to share with you. And of all things, it's the story of a graveyard. I know that probably does not sound very attractive at this moment, but trust me, it applies so directly to what our Lord Jesus is going to be saying this morning. Here's the graveyard. First of all, it's one of the oldest and largest Jewish cemeteries in all of the world. People have been buried in this graveyard that stretches for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of yards. They have been buried there for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. In fact, this was an active cemetery even at the time of Jesus. And there's a reason for that. The cemetery is located on the Mount of Olives. And according to the great Hebrew prophets, when Messiah comes... He will appear on the Mount of Olives and reveal himself, and he is going to raise the dead. And as a result, for over 2,000 years, devout Jewish people have longed to be buried on the Mount of Olives. Today, those cemetery plots cost a huge fortune. But in Jesus' day, People actually moved to Jerusalem in the, the final years of their lives so that they could be buried on the Mount of Olives so that when Messiah came, they would be raised to life. On the Mount of Olives today, you can still see some of those, not just grave sites, but you can actually see the burial places of people going back to the time of Jesus. I'd like to show you one picture that I snapped. It is not the best picture. I freely admit that. It's actually taken in a cave, into a cave, shot into a cave on the Mount of Olives. And what you're seeing there is an ossuary. It's a bone box. It, it, it's a, approximately, oh, 18 inches long and uh, about a foot and, oh, maybe 14 inches high. It's 2,000 years old. It goes back to the time of the temple and the time of Jesus. We have no idea who was buried in this bone box, but you can still see it today in a cave on the Mount of Olives near one of the largest and oldest Jewish cemeteries in all of the world. South of there, about 30 years ago, Another bone box, an ossuary, was discovered. It looks a whole lot nicer than this one. I apologize, the photo's not the greatest, but this photo is because it was taken in museum, in the Israel Museum. And this bone box, this ossuary, was discovered south of Jerusalem in the year 1990 when they were widening a road. And as a result, the bulldozers were brought in. And as a bulldozer began widening the road, they exposed an ancient tomb below the surface. Archaeologists were immediately called out. People were lowered into the tomb. 
and they discovered about a dozen of these ossuaries, including this incredibly gorgeous one. Now, let me ask you a question. Which bone box would you rather be put in? In, in this plain and simple looking one or in this absolutely gorgeous one? I mean, isn't that a work of art? That, that is carved out out of limestone, and it has survived for 2,000 years. It goes back to the time of Jesus. Which bone box would you rather be in? It seems like a simple question, but it's actually a trick question. We don't know who was buried in the first bone box, in the first ossuary. We do know who was buried in this one. It's one of the most remarkable discoveries made in the last 100 years. Because you see, on the side of this bone box is carved the name of the occupant, Joseph Caiaphas, the high priest who presided over the trial of Jesus, who said, who said, it, don't you understand it's necessary that one man die rather than that the whole nation perish? The man who said, do we need any more evidence? He has convicted himself crucify him. At first glance, you might say, boy, I think I'd rather be buried in a pretty box like that one until you realize who's inside. And then suddenly you realize that it's not what you possess that matters. It's rather who possesses you. And that's at the heart of what Jesus is talking about today in the story we're going to examine together. It's recorded in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 12. I'd invite you to uh, open your Bibles. Luke, chapter 12. We're going to begin at verse 13. This is what we read. Someone in the crowd said to him, to Jesus, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. You know, even in Jesus' day, that the death of people in the family created all sorts of issues. And apparently the issue here is, this is a younger brother. The tradition in Jesus' day is the oldest brother got a double inheritance. And now you have a younger brother apparently coming to Jesus and saying, Teacher, would you tell my brother to give me more than what I've got? Jesus sees into the man's soul. And he understands that this is a question not about fairness. This is a question of greed. And so Jesus replies, verse 14, Man, who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you? Then he said to them, Watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. Isn't that a powerful truth? Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. You can have the prettiest bone box in Jerusalem. But if your heart's not right with God, you've got nothing. In fact, you've got less than nothing. And so Jesus, seeing right into the heart of this young man, says, be on guard about greed. I have to believe those words apply to you and me as well, don't you? I mean, the Lord understands how easily we can begin focusing on stuff instead of him. And it's in that context that Jesus tells one of the greatest stories ever told. And here it is. Verse 16 of Luke chapter 12. And he told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man yield an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones, and there I will store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. Do you hear his song? It's I, yai, yai, yai. It's me, 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 me. <laughs> that, that's what the guy is saying. I've got everything I need. I've got my stuff. And then Jesus, then Jesus gets to the heart of the matter. And he says, 
But God said to him, verse 20, You fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? In other words, then they're going to be arguing about how to divide the spoils. And you have nothing. It was all me, me, me. And now you suddenly realize it's God, God, God. And Jesus says, this is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich toward God. Now, please note, Jesus is not saying that it's wrong to have stuff. Jesus is not saying that things are evil. Jesus is not saying that, you know, any material possession is, is, is just forbidden for a true believer. That's not what he's saying. What he's saying is this. You can have everything the world has to offer. But if you do not have a relationship with the living God, you have nothing that lasts. It's just that simple. And boy, that is a truth that needs to be comprehended in our day and age, isn't it? You can have everything the world offers. Let's be honest, we Americans have so much. But we are often absolutely poverty stricken in our relationship with God. And what Jesus is saying is, seek the riches that really matter. In fact, after telling this story, Jesus went on to talk to his disciples and to those who were following him. He says, therefore, I tell you, verse 22, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, or about your body and what you will wear. For life is more than food and the body more than clothes. And then he goes on and he says, consider how the wild flowers grow, verse 27. They do not labor or spin, yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, how much more will he clothe you, you of little faith? And then verse 31, but, and keep in mind, dear friends, it's everything after the but that counts. Okay, but seek his kingdom and these things will be given to you as well. In other words, with God, you and I have everything. Without him, we have nothing. And so what I'd like to do in the time that we have remaining this morning is to spend a little bit of time reflecting on what Jesus has said here and applying the scriptures to those fundamental truths that he is unveiling before our eyes and simply ask ourselves the question, where do I find spiritual wealth? Where do I find riches that last? Where do I store up treasures that are in heaven? That's what Jesus talks about. And where does that come from? Where can you and I in one of the wealthiest nations the world has ever known, find true riches? And the answer is, it's with the living God. And he offers that in such amazing ways. First of all, he offers us incredible riches in his word, in his teaching, in what we just read this morning, these teachings of Jesus. I mean, he taught like no one has ever taught before. Even when his enemies went to arrest him, they came back and said, no one has ever taught like this man. They couldn't do it. His word, it's a powerful word. And it brings riches into our lives, abundant riches. Listen to what the psalmist said. This is from Psalm 19. If you have your Bibles, you know, hang on to uh, Luke 12 for just a second, but turn to Psalm 19. Psalm 19, beginning at verse 7, we read these words. The law, the Torah, the instruction of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The decrees of the Lord are firm, and all of them are righteous. They are more precious than gold, than much pure gold. 
His word brings genuine riches into our lives. They, they are nuggets of gold, his teachings. What God says, it brings true wealth and genuine riches. I know personally how that word has impacted my life, not just once, but repeatedly throughout the years. From the time I was a boy, a word that taught me how much God loved me, as a teenager, reading that word for myself for the first time, reading through the Bible and realizing that God loves us in such an amazing way. But what I also realized is I need a savior. That word convicted me. I, I can remember as a 14, 15 year old thinking I was a pretty good kid. I, I did well in school. I was a good athlete. I, was, I obeyed my parents. In a day when everybody was letting their hair grow way down long, I kept it nice and short. I thought I was doing quite well. And then I read these words of Jesus, words in the Gospel of Matthew. And it was like a knife going into the innermost recesses of my heart. And I realized that what's on the outside doesn't matter, but what is on the inside, that's what counts. And Jesus said, you know, if, if your priorities are messed up, you need to come before the living God in repentance. And I still remember weeping in my bedroom as I read his word, a word that spoke directly into my heart and life and that changed the direction of my life. His word brings riches. It brings genuine wealth. Personally, I've seen over the years how that word has continued to impact me. And I've seen that in so many of your lives as well. And I know it's true in the lives of others that none of us know. But the fact of the matter is, when we are in the living word of God, when we are listening to what he is saying, what his voice declares, it brings not only clarity to life, it brings joy to the surface, abundant joy in knowing that God loves me, that God gave his only son for me, that he is coming back at the end of days. I do not have to fear. Not only do I not have to fear today, I do not have to fear the future because he is in control of the future. He is in control of all things. And his word, his word brings abundant life. It is a good word. And that is the word that can transform and renew even the most broken of individuals. It is also a word that can transform and renew even the most arrogant, self-centered, and uh, me, me, me kind of person because it's a word that penetrates the soul. God speaks, and when we hear his voice, it changes us from within and it brings genuine riches. You know, the stuff we possess today, it perishes in the end. It's been interesting. Jan and I have been doing a, a little purging in our house over the last few years, trying to, you know, we've lived in the same place for 26 years. It's amazing how much you accumulate in that period of time. And, and our kids have been so gracious about that. Basically what they've said, they haven't said it in these words, but you know, you guys are getting really old. We don't want to have to clean up this place once you're gone. <laughs> and and so, so we've been purging things and we've, we found a lot of stuff that we forgot that we even had. And as I look at many of those things, it, they bring back all sorts of memories. But one other thing comes to mind, and that is none of this stuff is going to last. None of this stuff is going to survive. But there is one thing that will always survive. The word of God, his word is true. And nothing can take that away. And that is wealth that you and I can hang on to. We can hang on to it, not just in this life, but in the life to come. There's a second truth that we see about genuine spiritual riches in the Bible. And that is a word about God's presence, about his presence in our lives. I'd like you this morning to, to turn to the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation. This is Revelation chapter 2. It's a word Jesus spoke to believers in the city of Smyrna. 
You know, of, of all the cities of, in the book of Revelation, the, the seven cities to which Jesus addresses letters, uh, Smyrna is the only city that is still in existence today. But the people who lived in Smyrna at the time Jesus gave this revelation to his best friend, John, they thought they were poverty stricken. And here's what Jesus said to them. Revelation chapter two, verse nine. He said, I know your afflictions and your poverty. In other words, he knows what we're going through. He knows what his children are experiencing. If you're going through a time of deep grief, of great sorrow, of great trial, of great perplexity and, and, and uncertainty, you need to know he knows. He knows. And this is what he says to those he knows and who know him. He says, I know your afflictions and your poverty, yet you are rich. He goes on, be faithful even to the point of death, and I will give you life as your victor's crown. In other words, he gives true spiritual refreshment, riches, joy, and peace, even in the most difficult of times, because he is near us. You know, that's what the scriptures have said all along. The Lord is near to all those who call upon him. That's what we read in the Psalms. To all who call on him in truth. God is near. He is close at hand. And when we live with an understanding of his presence, no matter what may be going on in our lives, we are rich just as Jesus declares. Because he is near to his own. And he cares for you and for me. We matter to him. You may feel lonely today, but you need to know that with the Lord Jesus, you are never alone. You need to know that with the living God, you are never outside his thoughts. You are never away from his presence. His presence gives purpose and peace, comfort, joy. And even if you are poor as a church mouse, by the way, I, you know, I've, I don't know what a church mouse looks like. I, I did once see a mouse in church, but it didn't look any different than the ones that try to get in through my garage when winter comes here in Minnesota. You know, but even if you are as poor as a church mouse, you are rich in knowing the living God and through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And by the way, if you don't know him, if you have never encountered him, you need him. It's just that simple. You need him because he is good and he is faithful. And all of the stuff that matters to you right now, the day is going to come when people are going to be giving it away at a garage sale. Do you understand that? The things that you and I treasure, others are going to look at and say, what a pile of junk. And they'll just pitch it in the dumpster if they can't find some sucker to buy it at a greatly reduced cost. <laughs> you need the Lord. It's true. You need him. I do. We all do. Because we were created to live in a relationship with the living God. And if the Lord is not in our lives, then whether we recognize it or not, we are absolutely poverty stricken. I do not know about you, but I know for myself, when I stand face to face before the living God, the first word I want to hear out of his mouth is not, you fool. I want to hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant. Because knowing him, that is the only true riches that truly endure. And that brings us to a final truth, a final truth about genuine riches that is revealed in the Bible and is experienced by all who know the living God through faith in the Messiah, Jesus the Savior. It is a rich, a richness that comes through his son.
Listen to these words to the Philippians, the Apostle Paul. This is one of the, the truly the most joyous of all letters in the entire Bible. Philippians, it's just four chapters long. And to read it, the word joy or rejoice occurs over and over and over again. I think it's like 16 times in this short little letter. It was written at a time when the Apostle Paul was in jail. I, I don't know about you, but I, I've been to jail. I don't want to go back. I, I've visited people in jail. I was also locked up in a federal penitentiary one time when I was in seventh grade for a field trip. Our class went down to the federal prison in Marion, Illinois. And we were taken into the federal prison. And at that point, one of the tour guides asked for someone to serve as a volunteer to go into one of the cells. I got volunteered. I, I did not raise my hand. I, had, I wanted no part of that. But I had friends around me who were more than happy to push me forward. And I ended up in the cell, and they closed the door on me. And I thought, this is not a place I ever want to spend time in. I've talked to many people who have been in jail, and I know it's not where they want to be either. I know how depressing and discouraging that can be. And yet I know something else. I've talked to people in jail who found that in that time, God became real for them in a way that was just absolutely amazing. Because no matter what our circumstances, when we know the living God, we are spiritually rich. Paul wrote this letter from prison. He knew what it was like to suffer, but he also knew what it is like to have abundant joy and true riches. And so in Philippians chapter 4, verse 19, he says the following, My God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. In the Lord Jesus Christ, there are genuine riches. In the Lord Jesus Christ, there is true wealth. In the Lord Jesus Christ, no matter the circumstances of your life or mine, there is abundance, abundant life. That's what Jesus gives. He said, I have come that you might have life and have it in abundance. In Christ, there is true richness. There is real wealth. There is wealth that lasts. You know, your stock portfolio may be doing well, but tomorrow it could take a hit. Your bank account may be depleted right now, but tomorrow the bank could collapse. There is only one thing that endures no matter what is going on in the world around us, and that is the very word and presence, the very son of the living God. And that is where real wealth is found. And that's what Jesus was talking about. And boy, doesn't that speak to your heart? I know it does mine. And it reminds me. It reminds me that there is nothing in this world more important than knowing the living God through Jesus, my Savior. It's true for me. It's true for you. Don't run the risk of being a fool. Don't persist in foolishness. Hear the voice of the Son of the living God and understand that those who are rich in Him have something that truly lasts. God is good. He's faithful. And He keeps His promises. It's just that simple but it's also that profound. God bless you today. And may the Lord Jesus Christ speak into your soul in a powerful way this day and in the days to come that you may have lasting and abundant wealth in Him. Amen? Amen. Amen. Well, let's take a moment for prayer. 
the Lord our God. We, we are truly in awe of you. We, we admit our own failings, Lord. We admit our sin. We've so often concentrated on stuff rather than seeking you with our whole heart. Have mercy on us and forgive us, Lord. More than that, fill us with the joy of your presence. Fill us with the assurance of Jesus' love, the assurance that his sacrifice on the cross has paid for every one of our sins. The assurance that because he is alive, we also will be raised on the last day. We thank you, Lord, that you've always kept your word. We thank you that the day is coming when the Lord Jesus will return, when he will again stand on the Mount of Olives where 2,000 years ago he revealed himself as Messiah. He will come in like manner as we saw him go. And he will raise the dead. And we will live with him forever. And we will reign with him. And we will behold you face to face. What greater riches are imaginable than that? Oh, Lord, we bless you and we desire with all our heart to know you, to follow you, to love you. And we rejoice in knowing that we are loved by you. Amen. Amen. I'd really invite you, if you're watching online or if you're in a home somewhere or a coffee shop, whatever the case may be, if, if you're watching this uh, after, the, the effect, after the fact or whatever the case may be, I'd really encourage you to take to heart these things that Jesus has said in this amazing story, the story of the rich fool. And, and I just simply ask you to apply that to your own life. You know, you, you know where you are this day in your relationship with God. You know whether that is a thriving relationship or a relationship on the rocks or a relationship that's never been. And God knows too. And he wants you. He wants you desperately. Because you see, we were created for the very purpose of living life in his presence. And that's what he offers us. Don't want to miss it.